There's different ways to address ureteral stones. There is a way to address them medically and certainly in people. That is uh, the, the first course of action. I guess my feeling for medical management in uh, cases of ureteral stones is that in some cases it's worth attempting, and we'll see which cases those are. And then what's reported in the literature is about a 50, 15 sorry, to 20% success rate. The chances of success are greater in small stones, so those that are less than 2 millimeters, and those that are very, very distal and so closer to the bladder. Um, medical management consists of giving lots of fluids. Again, if there's a heart murmur or pre-existing heart disease, then um, that could preclude this treatment, or certainly if it is done, uh, monitoring must be done. So to make sure the animal does not go into overt congestive heart failure. Prazosin, which can be given in cats and dogs, and does have a relaxing effect on the smooth muscle of the ureter, so it can stop spasms around the stone that could prevent it from moving. A mantol CRI can be given also, just to help, again, create an intense diuresis and hopefully push the stone into the bladder. If uh, we don't give prazosin, occasionally we can uh, give amitriptyline, which has also been shown to have a relaxing effect on the ure ureteral smooth muscle. When do we intervene for ureteral stones? Well, only when they are obstructive or if there are huge amounts of hematuria. Uh, certainly if they're clinically silent, um, then I would not intervene. Medical management can be used, um, again, to help pass these stones. However, I have had cases in which stones were not obstructive, not causing problems, were treated medically, and then became obstructive. So that is one danger of using medical management is that um, the stones could become obstructive, move out of a non-obstructing site to an obstructive site. There is surgical management of ureteral stones in which we go in surgically and remove the stone. So there are a lot of complications with ureteral surgery, and most of the cases we see with ureteral stones are either cats or small dogs, um, which makes the surgery very, very difficult since we're dealing with a very small uh, ureter. Complications that are reported are pretty high, 31% uh, morbidity and 18% mortality, and a lot of cases will reoccur. So even if we go in surgically and remove them, um, there's high rates of urine leakage, stricture, following surgery because again we're dealing with a very um, inflamed and small ureter um, and a lot of these animals are stone formers and so even if the surgery is successful and they get through it well they can have recurrence. If we look experimentally um, small stones um, can pass through canine ureters some of the bigger stones, um, so it's kind of two millimeters is kind of the, uh, the limit if they're less than about 2.3 millimeters often in canine ureters they'll pass 2.8 millimeters, they become impacted. And in cats, I've seen impacted one millimeter stones. Um, and so a lot of cat times, cats, even if they have teeny tiny little ureteral stones, they will become impacted given the small diameter of the lumen of uh, the cat ureter, which in the normal cat is, is about one millimeter. So our, there are other ways of addressing uh, ureteral stones other than medical management. There is a procedure that involves stenting. And the beauty of placing a stent or a very flexible uh, double pigtail catheter uh, with one end in the kidney and one end in the bladder is that this implant uh, allows flow around the stones. So you don't actually have to remove the stones. You can leave them in place, but flow is reestablished. And also, if there were to be stone reoccurrence, then it's not dramatic because, again, we have this um, stent or this catheter that remains in place and ensures um, drainage. How these stents are placed, uh, they can either be placed um, endoscopically in female animals, um, in male cats they need to be placed surgically, um, and in some female cats if there's a number of stones um, then we will go in surgically. In female dogs these stents are generally placed um, by endoscopy so no surgery is required. And in male dogs, uh, small male dogs, uh, sometimes surgery is required. It really depends on the case and the number of stones. Um, surgically, when we go in to place these stents, we make a small um, bladder incision um, and remove any bladder stones that might be present, and we push this catheter up through uh, the uh, papilla, ureteral papilla in the bladder, um, so that we're not making any kind of incision within the kidney or the ureters, and so the recovery time is is, uh, is really only a day or two, uh, as we would expect with a cystotomy. 
The beauty of these catheters is that uh, they help bypass ureteral obstructions that can not only be caused by uh, stones and debris, but occasionally tumors, or if there was a stricture in that area, it can help it reestablish flow. And the ureter itself does not like to touch the stent, and so what occurs once the stent is placed is called passive ureteral dilation, in the sense that the ureter will dilate around the stent, which just ensures better urine flow around it. And we have also used a combination of surgery in order to remove the large obstructive stones, um, and we place the stents after surgery in order to prevent stricture formation. And so to come back to Paloma, uh, we did perform medical therapy in her, uh, even though she was not necessarily a good candidate for that. Uh, we did attempt it, and it did not work. And so we went in and placed uh, a, put a guide wire uh, up through, made, we made a small incision in her bladder, got the guide wire up into her kidney, bypassed the obstruction, and we were able to pass the stent over it. And those are the images that you're seeing. These are fluoroscopic images of her kidney on the left, and her bladder is on the right-hand side. And in image C, you can see contrast has been given into the renal pelvis, which is highlighted by the yellow arrow. There's a guide wire that's looping around a torturous ureter, which is the uh, white arrow, and the black arrow shows you the transition from the actual uh, ureteral stent to the guide wire. And in image F, you can see that uh, there's a double pigtail catheter placed in the kidney along the bladder. And here's just an image of a multifenestrated um, double pigtail catheter very soft, lots of little holes in it. One week following the procedure, she was no longer azotemic, which was fantastic. Uh, she had marked improvement of her hydronephrosis on abdominal ultrasound, and her specific gravity remained low, so we actually were able to, to bring her back to an iris, uh, an iris stage um, one renal failure. So she was not azotemic, but she had chronic kidney disease and had a low specific gravity. One year later, her iris stage um, and stent are well in place, and her iris stage has not progre progressed at all, so she has stable uh, chronic kidney disease. So to conclude this talk, I would say look for ureteral disease, especially in cats with chronic renal um, disease. Uh, we do tend to see, again, uh, lots of cats um, that we, if we don't take abdominal x-rays, we will not know that they have a ureteral stone, so I definitely try to get abdominal x-rays on my chronic renal failure cats just to know um, if they have stones or not. And the reason, obviously, to do this is that we can do something about it, uh, the sooner the better. And there's lots of new um, and exciting minimally invasive procedures that are out there for cats and dogs, um, not only ureteral stenting, but also uh, lots of other procedures um, that can be done also. There, uh, just to go along the lines of endourology, since we're into that, um, there's lithotripsy that can be done, which is fragmenting stones using an endoscope and a little uh, laser probe. And this is a video of a uh, dog bladder with a calcium oxalate stone that we just exploded using, um, I'll just play that again, um, using an endoscope with a laser probe. And so we do that in the morning and the dog can actually go home in the afternoon. No surgery is required and all of the small fragments can be eliminated quite easily. This works really well for urethral stones in male dogs um, that we just cannot get out of the urethra and push into the bladder. Uh, we talked about ureteral stenting, but there's also urethral stenting for dogs uh, that have either strictures due to stones that were uh, stuck there for a while or most commonly to transitional cell carcinomas that can invade uh, the trigone um, and the urethra causing urethral obstruction. And this is actually a cat, which is a little unusual, but a cat that had uh, transitional cell carcinoma. Uh, so on the um, left-hand side, there's a tumor that's almost completely obstructing the urethra. This is actually a view of uh, the cat's urethra. And on the right-hand side, uh, you see a metallic stent that's been placed that's now pushed the tumor aside, and we can actually appreciate the lumen of this cat's uh, urethra. And this obviously can be done in cats and dogs. There are also urethral collagen injections uh, that we can do for urinary incontinence. So for dogs with sphincter mechanism incompetence that are not responding to traditional therapy uh, with alpha adrenergics and uh, estrogen, low-dose estrogen, 
uh, then collagen can be injected into the internal sphincter by endoscopy. This too is an outpatient procedure. It can be done in the morning. The dog is discharged in the afternoon. And this bulking procedure just helps strengthen the internal sphincter by bulking it up. And uh, so this is something that definitely can help uh, out your patients with refractory urinary incontinence. And there's also cystoscopic guided uh, laser ablation of ectopic ureters. Um, so dogs uh, that have ectopic ureters that cause incontinence uh, can definitely now be addressed. Instead of going to surgery, we can actually uh, do it by endoscopy. This too is, an, is a morning procedure. The dog is discharged in the afternoon. And we just take a little scope in and uh, excise the extra membrane, which is the ectopic ureter. Um, and we bring it right into the bladder so that uh, the dog is no longer incontinent and we have corrected the ectopic ureter without ever having uh, to perform uh, surgery on the bladder or the ureter. Um, so no stitches, uh, no surgeries involved, all of this is done by a laser and an endoscope. So this is a really nice, neat, quick procedure um, with very little discomfort. Again, that, uh, that works really, really well. Uh, so I would like to thank you for listening to this conference, and I would like to thank uh, my mentors with whom I did a fellowship in interventional endoscopy and radiology at the University of Pennsylvania, which are Drs. Chick Weiss and Allison Barrett. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and certainly uh, this you have my email, uh, that if you do have any questions or any comments, or if you would like to um, refer any cases or discuss any cases, and I would uh, be happy to discuss them with you either by phone or by email. So thank you and have a, a good day.